this afternoon for our presentation talking about SAP and AWS. Uh, my name is Carl Bacher. I'm a sales leader with Amazon Web Services. And I'd like to take about uh, an hour with you here this afternoon to talk a little bit about our platform, um, some of our customers, and how they've deployed SAP solutions on AWS. And I'd also like to invite one of our customers up here um, from Ingram Micro to talk about their journey um, regarding SAP and AWS. So this has been an interesting journey at all of the AWS summits uh, so far. In 2018, we kicked off our summits uh, in New York where we spoke with AIG about their migration to AWS. We then followed it up in Chicago, talking with the corporation Harris Logic about their migration to AWS as it relates to uh, in-memory workloads for HANA Analytics. And we're closing it off here in Toronto with Ingram Micro to talk about their HANA workload on AWS as well. But before we get into the technical details of Ingram Micro's migration, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about AWS's pace of innovation and how we've been investing in our uh, SAP platform for AWS over the last number of years. So this is one of my favorite slides to talk about. Um, a number of bullets on this slide and milestones that are really important to us and our accomplishments. Um, I'll highlight just a few of them. So beginning in uh, 2008, actually SAP became a customer of ours, and we've formed a very strong partnership since. Um, AWS itself opened its doors, or I should say its APIs in 2006, so they were one of our very first and earliest customers on the platform. Uh, but since then, we, again, we have a number of success, uh, successful launches and milestone accomplishments on our platform really broken up into, I would say, three key areas. One being uh, investment in infrastructure, second being investment in migration programs to help our customers, and third is a fairly new um, uh, dimension or wave for us where we've been investing in digital transformation, and I'll talk about that a little bit at about the end of my presentation. So breaking it into those three categories, uh, infrastructure investments, you can see a number of milestones here beginning in 2016 where we began to invest in larger virtualized infrastructure for SAP environments. So as of today, uh, with our platform, we have instances where we can scale up HANA environments up to four terabytes and all the way out to 50 terabytes. Uh, certainly wasn't the case in 2015, 2016, but our customers were asking for larger instance types as they were doing their migrations to HANA, and we were able to meet that demand of the market. I'm going to share a little bit more uh, at the end of our presentation of what our lo roadmap looks uh, like past four terabytes. Um, some very, very large instance sizes coming out for us in uh, uh, the second half of this year, or the next few months, to, uh, to be honest, to be in fact. Um, second wave of investments, like I mentioned, is investments in migration uh, assistance programs and uh, our partner network. So as many, many customers are running SAP on-premise or in a colo today, they need migration tools and assistance to, to migrate to AWS. So we have some programs, uh, specifically one called FAST, which helps our customers migrate from any DB on-prem to HANA on AWS, and truly uh, um, a weekend, if you will. So we've got some programs and partnerships with SAP in place there. Last being, uh, investment area being our digital transformation initiative. So. We've been noticing a, a, a focus in the market where we're looking for a new compelling event for our customers to migrate SAP to AWS. And with the integration of AWS APIs and SAP's API gateway as well, we've been able to do some innovations there. So again, I'll talk about some, that more in detail at the end of the presentation. But really the takeaway from this slide is we want to share with our customers is that we've been focusing in SAP and on AWS for truly over 10 years now. Um, we've been innovating in both our infrastructure, innovating and investing in both our infrastructure, migration programs, uh, and digital transformation on AWS. And it's been a strong partnership with SAP along the way. In terms of SAP SaaS platforms that are running on AWS today, you might be familiar with a couple of these icons here on the other side of the slide, such as Concur, Hybris, and Fieldglass. So again, these are pro uh, platforms that are SAP based that you're running on AWS today already. So getting in some of the philosophies of AWS, we use this concept called um, one- and two-way doors. So a one-way door at AWS is a decision that you make. It's a long-term commitment, and we're, we're sticking to that commitment for the foreseeable future. Best way I can describe that uh, in an imagery here is skydiving out of a plane, right? Once you jump out, gravity's got one job to do, and that decision's been made. There's no pulling yourself back into the plane. But a two-way door, and again, an Amazonian or an Amazon concept, is the ability to move through a door, move back through it, try it again, experiment. And we like to apply this model to our SAP workloads and our enterprise customers, specifically kind of breaking the standard model of understanding 
uh, SAP as a you know one one time deployment, and we hope that it's right. We hope the sizing is right. We hope the configuration is right, into a model where we can try and experiment on the platform. So deploying POC systems, um, sizing SAP systems differently, demoing HA and DR, and really proving it back to our stakeholders to earn their trust and show them that this platform works correctly, the solution works correctly, the software package works correctly, and if it doesn't, we roll back and there's no long-term commitment. So again, a two-way door concept using the AWS platform really kind of breaks the standard model of SAP, but we want customers to be able to experiment our platform and try things. In the light of experimentation, uh, AWS platform is fully self-service. So if you've had a chance to use our AWS console, deploy instances, deploy services, um, a web-based interface, um, truly anyone from intern can, to executive can deploy a, a workload on AWS, whether it be SAP or another enterprise workload, you have access to all of this, this broad access to tools of our AWS platform uh, at any level inside the organization. So we want to create a platform, or we have created a platform, to help our customers um, try and experiment things on AWS. So as it relates to our overall strategy, um, we really break it up into a, a number of segments that help our customers in the market. So we call this our 360 degree strategy, and I take, like, take a couple minutes to talk about each of these particular areas. So I'll start in the bottom corner here around replatforming. So for every customer, the SAP journey is different, but ultimately the destination is the same. So SAP is, has a mandate by 2025 to be on a HANA database. And then from an application perspective, we're moving towards the notion of the uh, simplified platform. So S4 HANA, BW4 HANA, C4 HANA as well. So as a customer is going through that, that journey, there's going to be many different paths. So sometimes that path involves replatforming the SAP solution. So looking at a migration to ASC, a migration to HANA, a migration to another database provider as part of your uh, migration to that, or to, to arrival at that destination of HANA on an S, uh, S simplified platform from SAP. So from an AWS perspective, we support all of the databases that SAP supports. Um, so ASC, MS SQL, DB2, Oracle, and HANA, of course, as well on our instances. Second part of the transformation or 363 strategy is digital core transformation or the application layer of AWS. So on your journey, again, you may be looking at a functional transformation, an application transformation, or a new, um, uh, a new product or offering from SAP. So in terms of what SAP is offering in their portfolio and services of products, these are supported on AWS as well. So the business suite, of course, S4 HANA, Suite on HANA, uh, BW4 HANA, and soon uh, C4 HANA will be certified as well on, uh, on AWS. But again, as customers are going through this journey, many different roads, many different uh, ways of getting to that final destination. I'll move up to the, um, the top, uh, I'll call it dark, dark red or orange partner corner here. So this is what's specifically important for us, and I mentioned our investment in customers in a couple slides earlier. But at AWS, we've built a network of certified partners, um, uh, SIs and GSIs that help our customers uh, build and deploy these solutions on AWS. So these are partners that are not only certified on the AWS platform, these are partners that are certified on, by SAP and also hold the competency of running SAP on AWS. It's a special competency for these partners. Um, so whether it be an industry-specific uh, solution partner or a GSI, we've got a number of these that help our customers in doing migrations to AWS, as well as our own internal professional services and solution architecture team. Moving a little bit over here to the orange uh, segment is our Simplify. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that SAP has got a number of solutions that run on AWS today from the SaaS perspective, and this is where we help our customers as well. So um, if you're using maybe a Concur for travel and expense, Ariba for supply chain, uh, Field Glass or Hybris for any type of e-commerce or shopping cart solution. SAP and AWS offer a package solution from that perspective as well where that platform runs on AWS. Last but not least is again this new digital transformation area that I was referring to a bit earlier where we're ex we want to extend our platform. So being able to move an SAP workload to AWS and extend or unlock that potential uh, future business value of the platform, meaning the ability to integrate SAP with things such as Alexa, IoT, AIML, a big data lake, for example, is now possible on AWS. So again, we wanted to help customers create a new compelling event of why to look at SAP on AWS, and this extend strategy is really important for us going forward. So again, kind of the takeaway, 
AWS and SAP have been a long, long time relationship together where we formed a strong partnership, again, where we've certified their platforms on our infrastructure, and then they've certified their products on our infrastructure as well. We've got a strong partner network, um, many, many different options where we can help customers migrate their SAP solutions to AWS through database transformation or application transformation. And we've been focusing with our customers too to look at an extend strategy. So that being said, I want to take uh, a chance here to welcome up Mike from Ingram Micro. Uh, Ingram Micro was one of our customers who's running an SAP workload on AWS. And I'd like him to tell you a little bit about his journey uh, and where they've deployed their SAP workload. Thanks, Mike. I have the power now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, as Carl mentioned, I'm Michael McLeod. I'm a cloud services engineer with Ingram Micro Cloud. Uh, I've been here for a little bit over four years now. Uh, in my role, I help drive our cloud strategy. It's everything from selecting our vendors and our products, uh, architecture and design, uh, user and resource management, and uh, some of the technical implementation as well. I have a background in web hosting, and I originally cut my teeth doing uh, VoIP services for uh, telecoms here in Canada. Ingram Micro is probably a familiar name for some people here, but for anyone that is unfamiliar, we are one of the world's largest distributors of computer hardware. We are involved in shipping and invoicing physical things all around the world. We do inventory management and logistics, and we try and make sure your hardware gets where it needs to be when it needs to be there. When Ingram Micro wanted to get into the cloud business, uh, you, I think around 2014, they realized that cloud doesn't involve very many physical things. So they decided to spin up a new business unit, and they granted us a fair amount of uh, technical and organizational autonomy in order to try and accomplish this. Today, we run cloud marketplaces all around the world. Um, and our marketplaces help our value-added resellers with end-user onboarding and management, uh, provisioning of services, billing those services, billing their own customers, all the tedious stuff involved in being a value-added reseller. I'm here today to tell you with a story about our SAP deployment. We designed and deployed and launched our SAP platform in just under a year. Uh, but first, I should tell you about why we even bothered with this in the first place. As I mentioned, we have decades of experience shipping and invoicing physical goods all around the world. We're very good at it. But none of it, none of the technical tools we developed, none of the business processes, None of it knew what a monthly subscription is. When we created the cloud, biz the cloud business unit, we selected Cloud Blue to be our core uh, unit of our tech stack. Uh, it originally actually started as um, a solution sold to hosters of web and mail services, um, kind of to help those organizations bootstrap their businesses. So it did all of the user management, provisioning, and orchestration of those platforms. The company behind it also developed an open standard called APS, which allowed third parties to integrate with their solution um, and handle all of the provisioning details. We leveraged that uh, protocol uh, and extended it dramatically, and that's how we today support hundreds of cloud services. As great as this platform is, though, it is not a fully-fledged ERP system. It's just not what it's there for to do. And it meant that some of the financial reports and insights that our business teams needed just didn't exist. So we needed something so that uh, these teams didn't feel quite so blind. We decided to pursue uh, an SAP deployment. The traditional side of our business already had SAP deployed. So there was a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, resources that we could leverage to deploy our own uh, platform. And uh, so that's where we went. Now, obviously, we chose AWS, but it wasn't always an obvious choice for us. We do have a cloud-first mandate, but not necessarily a cloud-always mandate. Uh, even today, we still have four data centers um, spread around the world. Actually, more than that, but four ma main ones. And uh, so it wasn't necessarily obvious. But this was going to be the first project where we were working with the traditional side of the business. And we really wanted to do a cloud deployment, partly to demonstrate to the rest of the business just how awesome this business space was to be in. 
Uh, at the time, AWS was the only uh, vendor that would support production HANA workloads in a virtual machine. That's not the case today, but that definitely was a key factor in our decision making at the time. Also, we'd already started moving some of our workloads to AWS. Um, so a lot of our technical teams and our engineering teams, we were already familiar with some of the tools that we'd be using. And of course, cost was a factor, both the savings but also the flexibility. The traditional side of the company has some SAP workloads that are going to be up for refresh in the near future. And the thinking is, is that assuming this platform is successful, uh, we'll move those workloads into ours. So the ability to scale up our existing deployment from what we need today to what we'll need in two years, it's, uh, it was pretty appealing. As for the good stuff, how we actually did it, uh, we have a multi-account AWS strategy. There's a Keystone account that manages all of our integrations with our Active Directory. It's where the majority of the IAM controls are, that sort of stuff. Uh, that's all in there. Beyond that, we separate our platforms out into their own accounts. Um, this makes it easy to identify the cost center that stuff should be assigned to, and it's also a good spot for our additional access controls. In this case, it made even more sense because we were going to be working with the traditional business units. Uh, we don't normally work with them, so we wanted something kind of separate and where we could give them some access to just kind of the playground we were all going to be playing in together. Uh, as Carl mentioned, um, this uh, build, test, and rebu rebuild line, it, it's a lot to do with that two-way door that he was talking about. The SAP deployments in the traditional business and in general are fairly static once they're built, but uh, in our case, that wasn't how we approached building them. Uh, I think we tore down and rebuilt our dev and sandbox landscapes repeatedly probably six or seven times before we were felt we'd hammered out all of the details and really liked what we were handing over to the basis team to build with. Uh, in terms of our, uh, the cost controls, um, once it's all deployed, everything kind of runs all the time, so it makes purchasing our eyes and the decision-making around it pretty straightforward. We just bought one-to-one -one, uh, with a one-year full upfront RI being our sweet spot. Got us most of the savings that you can get right away, uh, but uh, in a year, if we want to increase the workload, we'll have that flexibility without having wasted any money. I uh, hope everyone can make out what's on the screen here. Uh, this is a very, very high-level view of our uh, production deployment. Uh, at the top section here, we've got uh, our Northern Virginia region, which is our primary region. Uh, at the bottom here, we've got Ohio, which is our secondary or disaster recovery site, and off to the side above the legend are uh, our offices. Um, our deployment is kind of broken up into a few logical groups. Um, stuff like the configuration management and monitoring, these services are actually hosted in our, the Keystone account, um, so connectivity there is through a cross-account VPC peering. And uh, within the SAP account, um, there's another group of servers that have all of the shared services, management tools, you know, uh, HANA Studio, HANA Cockpit, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, then, of course, we've got our uh, SAP 5 system landscape. You'll note that the DR region is uh, significantly more sparse. Uh, it has, it's only been built for holding our, a copy of our production landscape. Uh, we don't bother with having cross-region DR for our non-production landscapes. Our SAP platform isn't necessary to actually do business in our marketplaces, and this significantly drove some of the design decisions we made. It doesn't need to be up all the time. The customer impact to it being down for a little while is not noticeable. Can't be down forever, of course, but regular maintenance, that sort of stuff can actually just be done offline. Uh, recreating any of the data, though, would be a significant pain. So we focused on RP over, over RTO. And similarly, not all of the services in this environment are equal. So we built what we kind of call a lukewarm standby solution. Um, 
you'll see here that we don't have a, we have a primary HANA database in the primary region and the secondary is in the DR region. So, and these kind of decisions are actually throughout our design. It's designed for DR, not for high availability. Admittedly, that's sometimes a weird decision to make, but in our case, it made a lot of sense. Uh, when we were building this out or in the design phase, I actually built four separate designs. There was the cheap one, there was an HA one, a DR one, and then, of course, the one everyone wants to build, the one that's got everything. But when we really laid out what we needed versus what we wanted to build, we really just couldn't justify the, you know, Uber, DR, HA, everything design. Um, at the end of the day, uh, if it's down for an hour, no one's going to notice. So there was a lot of cost savings that could be had by focusing just on the DR. Um, however, even our DR design includes um, details that will make it easy to add HA later. As we move some of the workloads that are already existing for the traditional business into the environment, a lot of these needs will change, and it's going to be easy to drop in um, you know, the HA capability. There's some single instance application servers, for instance. They're still sitting behind a load balancer. It's not a very robust target group right now, but in the future we can drop in more app servers and make it HA, and it'll be nice and easy. I want to talk a bit about our DR strategy. Um, since this was the focus of the design, uh, we had to make sure that it would actually satisfy what we needed. Uh, the end goal is to have our data on multiple mediums at any one time. Uh, our primary HANA database replicates to the secondary via HANA system replication. Uh, this is our primary or our favored restoration source. Uh, it's fast, it's easy, um, and the data should be up to date. Uh, this replication happens over, uh, we're probably actually one of the first production users of cross-region VPC peering when it was released last November. Um, I'd been testing VPNs before that, waiting eagerly with bated breath for the cross-region VPC peering to come online. Um, other data types that exist, so HANA cuts out a bunch of, or two types of data to disk. There's the transaction logs that get cut out every 15 minutes, and uh, incremental and full database dumps that appear throughout the day. Um, we have Incron configured. Uh, Incron is a tool that uses iNotify to watch for file system events. So we have it configured to watch for these data files being written out. Uh, when HANA is writing out these files, uh, the transaction logs are small, but some of the database dumps are large. Uh, as it's writing them out, it writes them out to a dot file, and then once it's finished writing it out, renames the file in place to remove the dot and make it visible. We watch for those rename events in those directories, uh, so when we see them, we know that the file is finished being written out, and we immediately upload it to S3. Uh, the instances themselves have access to the S3 buckets through uh, uh, instance profiles, and there's a, a pair of S3 buckets in our Virginia region to collect these files. We then use cross-region S3 replication to copy that, those files to our Ohio DR region. So this is an event-driven approach, which means we should have uh, not just the uh, HANA replication to our DR region, but the file backups in our DR region as soon as possible after they're written out to disk. What this means is at any one time, assuming nothing's gone terribly wrong, we've got five copies of our data. There's the in-memory copy in HANA itself. There's the copies on local EBS disk in our primary region, the S3 copy in the primary region, and then in Ohio, we've got the EBS volume from the replica and uh, the S3 buckets as well. Our secondary HANA database is running in warm standby mode, so the data isn't actually kept in memory. It's just being written out to disk, and the uh, database indexes are kept in memory. This lets us run a much smaller database, um, like instance type in Ohio, uh, which saves us some money, um, but it does mean that we can't claim to have an in-memory copy in the backup region as well. But five copies is still pretty good for our needs, 
And um, since our DR strategy involves rebuilding or spinning up a bunch of hosts in the DR region, um, we have plenty of time to reboot that instance into a larger instance type and load everything into memory in the event of a disaster. All of this replication and copies of data can certainly grow to be fairly large. Um, so we do have a, a mix of cron tasks, uh, S3 lifecycle policies, and uh, AWS lambdas in place to help uh, clean up old data once uh, we don't need it anymore. We have some policies that dictate how long various copies of data are kept, and after that, they all get cleaned up. Uh, we do have uh, AMI image backups of our database, and it's scheduled to happen after the weekly full HANA database dump. So at any one time, we can restore from that copy and then just rebuild the data however we need. This is actually a battle-tested strategy. Um, a few months after we deployed, we did have an EBS uh, volume that decided to take a vacation and not come back. And uh, so we actually had to test this out. Uh, we were able to restore the instance itself from that weekly backup and restore the data from the secondary in the DR region um, uh, with no data loss. So it all worked as expected and as designed. Uh, when we were working out how we were going to deploy this platform, of course, automation was a big factor. Um, at the time, not all of our automation was where we wanted it to be. Uh, we had fairly robust and deep host-level configuration management with Puppet, uh, but we had fairly limited IaaS automation. Um, a lot of our, all of those data center environments I talked about, they're mostly VMware, and there were some limitations to uh, the Terraform vSphere provider that made it not very suitable for our needs. So we just hadn't put much effort into uh, developing an IaaS automation tool set. Uh, so when it was time to deploy this, uh, we had a couple of choices to make. Uh, in the end, we decided to forego extending the IaaS automation. Um, we kind of got what we needed out of some custom scripts and CSV files to describe our environment. Um, it got us reproducible and consistent deployment. Um, we can't like enforce the state going forward with the tool we have, but uh, in the end, it was a good compromise to make for us. Because once it's deployed, our SAP environment doesn't change a whole lot. We're not adding and removing hosts all the time. Where we are making changes is at the host level. And so for that, extending our puppet automation was, we felt would be more important long term. Speaking of puppet, we didn't puppetize SAP itself. Um, when we joined forces with the existing SAP basis team, they already had all, everything they needed to manage install and configure SAP, and we didn't want to get in their way by trying to make them learn a new tool set. So instead, we puppetize everything else about the host. So our Active Directory integration, firewalls, all of the backup configuration I was describing, that's all managed with Puppet. Um, and then uh, the basis team is uh, able to get in there and do their work on their own. This means the automation boundary follows the team responsibilities, which, if you can't automate everything, is a good way to do it, because it lets us do our work the way we want to, and the basis team can do their work the way they want to, and we all get along just fine. At the end of the day, we didn't find that the tech was the hard part. So part of our story is that we're a small part of a much larger company. And we work very differently from the rest of the company. As I mentioned, we were given very, very broad uh, technical and organizational autonomy when we were first created. Uh, we run our own data centers. We run our own technical platforms. We even run our own internal corporate IT. We weren't on using the same email platforms. We weren't using the same file sharing services. Everything was completely different. This let us move fast, and it was a good choice at the time to let us succeed. Uh, Ingram Micro knew that we were going to have to work differently, and they didn't want to smother us. Uh, so this was their approach. But it meant when it was time to start working with the larger organization on this shared platform, there was some friction. Um, it often felt like we were talking past each other. Um, 
and this won't always be the case today, but or always be the case, but today, uh, anyone who's working in cloud has probably also spent some time working in a more traditional IT environment. So we're often familiar with the capabilities of the tools that they're working with, but the reverse isn't always true. Um, Assumptions can be made about you know, what kind of equipment you might have in your environment or what its capabilities will be, um, and this will often inform um, especially security policies, stuff like that, and it just doesn't apply. Um, so this was the source of a lot of our frustration, as I mentioned, especially around security policies, which tend to be the least flexible aspects of uh, a corporate policy. Um, but we made it work, so we must have done a few things right. Uh, it seems kind of obvious to say, but a bit of flexibility and trust does go a long way. The people that you, we were working with, like, they weren't trying to be difficult. They were trying to do the best job that they could. It's just that the culture and the policies and the environment they worked with weren't conducive to how we had done business up until this point. And as frustrating as it was, I had to remind myself, like, these people are trying to do the right thing. And eventually, we even would convince them that you know, this approach is a good approach to solving a security problem. It achieves the same end goal. We just get there through a very different means. And in this case, um, we had strong support from executive management. They really wanted this project to succeed. And that was important in this case because it let our security teams um, it gave them the confidence that they actually could approve our approaches and not kind of be you know, left in a lurch because they approve some non-standard approach. Getting to that point uh, and getting, building that trust, um, I mean, it's again pretty simple to say, but phone calls and video conferences were really key. It's way harder to say no to someone when you can see their face. You should use that to your advantage if you're in this position. Look at them in the eye and ask for what you want, and they'll find it much harder to say no and much more likely to work with you and to find a way to make it work. You'll know that you're doing well with this when they start offering you advice on how to present your idea to their management to get it through. When that happens, you're making progress. And lastly, the other thing to remember when you've got a lot of passionate people in a room talking about how they want to build a platform, how they want to deploy something, it can easily tip over into bike shedding. Uh, with the cloud, though, you have an option. You can just build the bike shed in both colors and decide which one you like, and then just burn the other one to the ground. Uh, it's a pretty good strategy for cutting short some of those, decision, or those uh, discussions, which can go on for hours and hours, it feels like. Our traditional IT teams, they don't work in a very elastic environment. For them, they have to get the decision right the first time because rebuilding it is a huge pain. Whereas for us, it's the opposite. You can just build it twice. Those meetings with you know, five or 10 senior engineers trying to solve a problem, I mean, you're kind of just like feeding money into a furnace to come to a decision. Oftentimes, it's a lot cheaper to just run twice the platform for two weeks and see which one works better. So seriously, consider it. <laughs> That's all I really have for you today. A um, few things to remember. Automate for the long term. If you have to make choices about where you're going to automate, make sure it's where you're going to see some real value. Often, the extra effort to automate everything, I mean, it's nice. It feels great. I get that. Sometimes it's not worth it, though. Uh, assume that the people you're working with have good intentions, even when it's frustrating. And uh, when in doubt, shut up and just build it. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, well, what a wonderful story. I mean, so we talked about actually applying that two-way door concept uh, trying, experimenting, build, rebuild. Um, again, I think that's really, really important when it comes to SAP environments. Let's experiment. Let's see if it meets our business needs. I really like the um, 
I don't know if I like it or I'm intrigued by the DR story, right? We were able to prove that the DR platform worked. We've got five, Ingram has five copies of production data, two different locations, different states of storage. Um, and again, that's scalable. scalable. What a wonderful story. And then uh, I think the cost perspective is really interesting there too. I mean, AWS has a number of, uh, I'll call it, pricing options available for customers and reservations of our instances. Um, but really, the Ingram business found that one year was perfect for them and they were able to expand. Great story. Um, so to conclude from the AWS side, I alluded to a couple of things I was going to share earlier. Um, so we'd love to talk about our instance roadmap. Um, so I shared as of today, four terabyte scale up, 50 terabyte scale out is available on our platform. But we made some great announcements at SAP Sapphire um, just a few months ago in Orlando, where um, very shortly here, we're going to have six, nine, and 12 terabyte instances available on the AWS platform. Um, this is really exciting stuff here. These are um, cloud native native hyperscale appliances certified for SAP HANA. Same look and feel as the environments and EC2 instances that you're used to using today. Um, sit inside a VPC, AWS account, security groups, IAM policy. So again, the same look and feel. Um, the interesting thing about these new instances is they're going to be part of our bare metal family, which takes advantage of our new Nitro hypervisor platform technology. Uh, that means you as a customer get even more access to this high performance hardware, and it's especially important as it relates to these large SAP environments. Um, as you can see here in the, um, I'll call it dotted or checkered, uh, blue column, we're going to have some larger instance types beyond 12 terabytes coming out as well. And at Amazon, we're always listening to our customers and trying to meet their demands. So as I shared kind of our roadmap, you know, in 2015 timeframe, the largest instance we had was 244 gigs of in-memory. Um, and in 2018, 2019, we're going to be above 12 terabytes. So some really exciting stuff there to meet the demands of our enterprise customers. So kind of overall recapping the builder's platform. So when we apply that two-way door concept in the investments and innovations AWS has made in infrastructure, migration programs, and digital transformation, um, kind of worth noting some, some areas that we've been focused on, on in the, these, these pieces. So I talked about the uh, HANA, HANA certification in our instance platform roadmap. So we're certainly industry leading in there. Remember, these are cloud native instances that can be spun up with an API call um, in truly a matter of minutes to meet the demands and experiments uh, that your organization might be working on. Um, another area that we've um, been focusing on is optimizing end user experience. Uh, we just released at Sapphire an offering that uses our AWS AppStream platform to stream the SAP GUI for our customers. Um, this makes for a great use case for customers that have a single global instance, have got end users across the world. Um, that want to have the best performance possible. So again, the AppStream is a VDI streaming platform for the SAP GUI or any type of web front end for SAP. In terms of uh, continuous improvements for price and performance, I announced uh, the new bare metal instances will be running on the Nitro platform. The similar technology is going to be used in our other instances. So cer uh, certainly already our C5 and M5 instance types that are available today will be utilizing that Nitro platform so from higher performance for our customers. And then last is our kind of build on and two-way door philosophy. Uh, I'd like to tell customers that we have uh, what we call our quick starts are available today on the AWS website. So we have the option as a customer to deploy automated SAP deployments of SAP HANA and NetWeaver uh, in just about less than an hour with a few clicks now. So we at AWS have worked on some standard default scripting to build out this environment, which includes VPCs, security groups, and actually does some of the SAP installations already for you. So again, we wanted to provide customers with a platform that's self-service, uh, instilling a concept of experimentation with two-way doors, a roadmap, and just a great end-user experience for our customers. Last but not least, I uh, talked a little bit about uh, innovation or digital transformation for SAP and AWS. And I think this is really an area where I find a new, uh, new compelling event for our customers going forward. So we want you to think of SAP and AWS not just as compute storage and networking. Our platform is much, much broader than that. Um, we want to help our customers integrate their existing SAP solution with some of our next generation, loose, next generation solutions. So some examples of that. Um, Four different categories here, IoT, AI, DevOps, and uh, enterprise apps. Think of an IoT button or an Alexa skill 
that integrates with SAP. Alexa, tell me how many open orders I have. Alexa, tell me the inventory in this plant. Again, integrating these APIs together really creates a new uh, opportunity and unlocks a lot of business uh, value and business data between the two platforms. Um, image recognition into SAP, really neat situation there, doing image recognition for a customer, a part number, inventory to update a field with an SAP um, is really an area that we've been helping our customers build in an experiment as well. DevOps, which Mike talked about a little bit, um, further automating that platform deployment. So certainly, uh, day one, things are not automated 100%. We've got to gather requirements. We've got to try things a few times. But as we continue to define those requirements, we can automate the platform to automate installs to scale as necessary, and AWS and our SAP certified partners are certainly working and investing in that area. Uh, last but not least is enterprise app integration. So we talked a little bit about AppStream, but the ability to integrate with other uh, enterprise apps running on AWS. So again, looking at the larger, broader picture of let's move SAP to AWS to gain the performance, the two-way door, the price uh, competitive, competitiveness and capability of the platform, but also we can integrate with some of these next generation platforms as well. So I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up here. I wanted to open it up to any questions. Um, I'll bring Mike back up on stage. If you guys have any questions on our AWS SAP roadmap or the deployment, we'd be happy to, uh, to answer that. And then also, if you guys have a chance, please do uh, leave us some session feedback. We'd love to see what you liked, what you didn't like, and maybe what you'd like to hear about next time. Uh, just raise a hand if anyone has any questions. We've got a mic here in the back of the room. The uh, SAP App Stream, is that uh, available for uh, if you want to run SAP GUI uh, from an on-premise uh, environment? So we can, we can stream that way. The ideal configuration is that we would want to stream from an application server running on AWS. So as we break up the SAP application, we have database, app server, and the presentation layer. This would take care of the presentation layer. So as we have a... Um, Integrated, vertically integrated solution. Ideally, we'd like them to be all together, but we can stream from different locations. Other questions? Oh, one in the back I see over there. Sorry to make you run. Yeah. Question to Ingram. Uh, how many IOPS you are using in your uh, production and DR environment? Oh, not a ton of IOPS, um, since, of course, Hannah's all in memory. Um, we did have to uh, increase the provisioned IOPS on one of the drives just for the backup data. But uh, no, uh, for the most part, it's all uh, general purpose EBS volumes. Remember, there's two uh, EBS volume configurations. So we have GP2 volumes which are our general purpose volumes and uh, IO1 volumes for, for provisioned IOPS. Yeah. Other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay. Oh, wait, one more. All right, sure. <laughs> yeah, the presentation will be available after, afterwards after the, uh, after the show. And if you have any questions, please feel uh, free. Mike and I will just be up in the front here. Um, thanks so much for the time today. Hope this was a useful session for you guys. Have a great summit. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carl. Thank you.